Hi folks, I'm Woody and welcome back to the shed for another part of making the most of the mini sport. The previous half of this particular episode described the Dawn to Dust Challenge and my plan to take part by creating a drawing in the sky of the Ukrainian national symbol, hoping to use this as a focus of a fundraising effort. If that didn't bore you to distraction, then great, and it helped to raise a few pounds for the appeal. I managed to carry out the flying task on the 4th of April this year under some less than ideal conditions and, as they always say, even the best plans don't survive contact with reality. And mine certainly didn't. This episode then will explain why that was, while at the same time showing what outcomes achieved in the end. At the close of the first episode then, I left you with a fairly complicated route drawn on a quarter million scale chart and possibly a head full of arithmetic to take the place of the sat-nav. That took 30 minutes of your time, but what comes next took about 5 hours of mine, plus the messing about the previous day trying to get everything in place for the attempt. And producing this video, which was an epic all of its own. You be forgiven for thinking that in the first part of this episode we completed all that needed to be done other than climbing aboard the aircraft. Sadly though, aviation isn't quite like that. To begin with, a safe departure and subsequent return to Mother Earth needs suitable weather. Not too much wind, or if the wind is strong, it's blowing in the right direction. Not too much cloud, or if there is, it's well above my planned altitude. No rain, snow, gales, fog, plagues of locusts. Well, this is Scotland in early spring, so expect all, almost all of them except the locusts. A careful inspection of all the online weather reports and forecasts suggested that I had a good chance of getting the flight completed on Tuesday the 4th, a lot earlier than I planned, but given that I'd already begun fundraising and published part one of the story, I decided that the sooner I did the flying the better. With the forecast looking promising, or at least not impossible, I rushed off to the shed to get the Moss Trooper ready for the following day. A thorough check of everything had to be done inside, as it was windy outside, and it was raining. Making sure nothing was broken, the bits that should move did, and those that shouldn't didn't. This is standard before any flight, but this time I had to make sure that the other stuff was more carefully checked as well. Is there enough oil to last for five hours? Is the fuel tank as full as I can get it? I needed to rig up the cameras to record everything I could, make sure I had a backup power supply for them, as well as the recording devices I'd need to produce the evidence to the judges that I'd done what I declared I would do. That last bit was critical. No track record, no entry. I did a lot of experiments in the run-up to this challenge, some by way of rehearsal and practicing all those techniques I talked about previously, and also to satisfy myself that I'd have at least two methods of recording the evidence keeping on top of the timing plan and making sure it was all done safely and within the rules. Because I'm doing this on my own in a tiny cockpit, everything had to be simple, sure and safe, and with fallback plans to cover every hiccup I could think of. I almost failed in that, but you'll need to stay with me to find out exactly what went wrong and how I got around it. The military have a saying that time spent in reconnaissance is seldom wasted. For this challenge, replace reconnaissance with rehearsal, and in theory, everything that might go wrong can be discovered and a plan B, C, or even a plan D made to rescue the situation if and when plan A goes wrong. My plan A for recording the track was to use a flight following app called Flight Aware, and this shows the record of a test flight. This should produce a record of the track, and thus the drawing, visible to the public in real time and able to be replayed. As a backup to that, I would run an app called Safe Sky. This is primarily designed to give warning of traffic in my immediate area, which would be a good safety feature, given that I'm going to be very busy with lots of jobs. And it also records where I fly and will produce a similar record as Flight Aware, but only visible to me initially, and it looks like this. This is me doing one of those rehearsals, testing myself to see if I could fly a square, or part of a square, just using a compass, airspeed indicator and a stopwatch. Oh, and the mental arithmetic we looked at last time. And it seemed to work. 
That should be enough, but to take care of the possibility that both didn't work, I'd have a Sky Demon plot running on a tablet which wouldn't be used for navigation, but purely as a track log, and though I didn't feel it would be needed. The Sky Demon record would leave a breadcrumb trail, complete with timings and altitudes. But this latter is also important as I'd be flying over a couple of sensitive areas and I have to make sure that I can prove I was above them. In the old days, a long stay in a single room in the Tower of London would be the penalty for failing to do so. What about timekeeping? I said that I have a timing target to make. This is a self-imposed nuisance factor, but adds an extra dimension to the challenge in that I can't just concentrate on going in a straight line. I'm going to need accurate timing to even find some of my turning points, as there's very little recognisable on the ground. But in addition, I've declared that I'll reach the last waypoint on the route at exactly 4 hours and 50 minutes after takeoff, which is the time the plan says it should take. If accurate timing is important, a good watch would be useful, wouldn't it? The most accurate watch I have is on my phone, but I'll need that for the Safe Sky app some of the time. But I should be able to flip between the two easily, right? If anything goes wrong with that idea, then I have a cockpit clock, actually a cheap battery powered watch, that I can synchronise to the phone's time. I've also got my wristwatch, so I set all three up to the same time the night before. I also need a stopwatch for detailed leg timing, so I can use the phone again for that, or a digital stopwatch on the panel, or once again my wristwatch, though the buttons are a bit fiddly to use for that job. I want to record as much video as I can for use in this production. The external 360 camera will get the first 30 minutes, then the battery will die. The three cameras in the cockpit will be set up to get as much information as I can see myself, but the batteries will expire after about an hour. So each unit's connected to an external power source, giving each camera plenty of juice and as large an SD card as it will fit into them. The last thing that has to fit is me, and with all that stuff in the cockpit as well, it's a bit of a tight squeeze. I'm wearing two layers of thermal clothing under a flying suit and a duvet waistcoat over that, topped off with a leather jacket which carries a first aid kit, a survival locator beacon and a wallet with bribes for the natives. It's wild out there. Sheepskin lined boots and gloves with the fingertips cut off so I can use the phone's touch screen. Goggles to fill over my glasses because I'll be spending at least half the flight looking into sun and I need some shade. Four cameras, two battery packs, half a litre of water and a runner's bottle. With all that, I weigh 88 kilos. Why is that important? Well, the maximum takeoff weight of the aircraft is 240 kilos, and empty of me, my clothes and cameras and petrol, it already weighs 128. Add those last lumps of metal and meat and you get 216. So there's enough left for 24 kilos of fuel, which is lucky as that's a full tank of 34 and a dribble litres. Just out of the shower I weigh 72 kilos. Six months ago it was 82. I needed to trade some body weight for fuel so you can see how long I've been planning this. I even had a proper haircut and cut my toenails, because every little helps. The last thing I did the previous night was to check the weather for the last time. It's not ideal, but it's acceptable. And so to bed. The following morning I was up extra early mainly because I couldn't sleep for running all the unconsidered what-ifs through my head once I'd woken up at 5.30. Breakfast, walk the dog, check the no-tamps. It'll be just my luck to have a search and rescue red zone right across my plan. But nope, everything seems to be clear. Now check the weather again. A question for you. Do met men have fathers? Yesterday's acceptable forecast is now trending firmly towards plan E, which is go back to bed. The webcam shows Easterton surface wind is about 7 gusting 12 across the runway and my safe limit is 10. It's going to be stronger than that and therefore turbulent over the mountains. Not only that, but there's worsening conditions around midday. A check on the Sky Demon website shows some heavy weather to the south but Braemar is still clear. Decision time? We'll go. phone call to Lossimov to tell them what I'm doing and a text to the Flying Circus to declare that the game's afoot, as Sherlock would say. I pull the Moss Trooper into the fresh air and get ready, hoping this is a good idea. With the pre-flight checks repeated from last night, I shoehorn myself into the kayak-sized cockpit and close the window. It's all a bit snug in here, but everything has just enough room to move the way it should. 
all the toys are arranged so I can operate them fairly easily without get, getting in the way. I can see everything I need to see and the maps and timing sheets are clipped to my legs so I don't drop them. If I do, I've got spare sets of everything in my boots. Clocks are checked again, pen to hand plus a spare, water tube out of the way under the straps, and it takes five minutes to set up all the IT, the recording stuff, the phone, the cameras and all the power leads, which have to be routed out the way of the controls. Engine start, warm up and power checks are all normal. I'm running out of excuses now. Time check, all three time pieces agree, so I'm going to launch at 10 minutes past nine. With the four hours and 50 minutes time en route, that means I'm aiming to reach the last waypoint at exactly 1400. This makes life and timing a bit simpler, and I have the feeling that might be a good thing. Power on, brakes off, here we go! Hop, and a skip, she's right at top weight, and a jump, a few feet in ground effect, and we're away! Uh, whoa, bumpy or what? We're directly downwind of a wind farm and despite the science that says it shouldn't be happening, we're getting a full dose of churned up air just at the most embarrassing time. A taste of things to come as it happens, so best to get warmed up early I suppose. You make a right hand turn to collect the first waypoint while I sort myself out. I've rehearsed this because I know I'll be a bit busy and I know where to turn. What I wasn't anticipating was how quickly I'd arrived there. The wind must be quite strong away from the shelter of the ridge. Bumping around, rock and roll, check that the safe sky is running on the phone. The bright flashing green tells me it knows where I am and it's doing its clever stuff. And it is quite turbulent. Just a few seconds it took to check the gadgets and I'm off track by 30 degrees. Once we're over the point, we turn to track about south for 18 miles. This is the time to sort out what I think the wind might be, but this is more difficult than I planned as the aircraft is being kicked around like the proverbial one-legged Indian. A glance upward shows a few lenticular clouds beginning to fall, which tells me the wind's quite strong from the south-southwest, but likely to be quite stable. This means there will be areas of fast rising air and areas where it's heading earthwards equally quickly. I need to think about how I can use that, but right now the priority is to point in the right direction or the drawing will look like a kid's crayon scrawl on day one of kindergarten. I need to find the two tits to the west of Benrinis and fly between them. This is easy. I'm in my own backyard and the peaks are easy to spot. What isn't so easy is keeping them in the right place on the nose. I've made a drift sight, if you can call it that, which allows me to assess the angle that I place my aiming point off the nose to account for the wind effect. From the centre to the outer rings, 4 degrees. So with my estimated wind as I pass 1500 feet of 220 at 20, I need to steer just over half of the maximum drift, which would be 20, so about 10 degrees to the right. This makes 194. I set 184, the plan track on the compass bug, and steer 194, and I see my aiming point is just out the left side of the ring. Over the waypoint, start the stopwatch on the phone, flip back to clock mode and note the time. And we're off. This is probably a good time to mention how I'm going to stay as close to the plan track as possible, since if I don't, it will not produce a decent drawing. I've got a compass, of course, but it isn't very stable, and in bumpy air it's practically useless for our purposes today, and today's going to be very bumpy, I think. Obviously I can't just continue to keep the waypoint on the nose, because if I do that, and although I'll certainly get there, it'll be about going the long way round, and that'll screw the drawing up. I've got a Canadia Horus system installed, which gets a GPS feed which I can use to read my track. Note this is track, not heading. In other words, it tells me my direction over the ground, not where the aircraft is pointing. As we all know, the difference between the two is our drift angle. And if I start from the correct place and get that angle right, then I'll fly along the planned track. This sounds like a cheat, but requires constant attention as the aircraft doesn't point in the same direction for more than a few seconds. And of course, I have to start right from the right place and the Horus won't do that for me. I have to navigate. The Horus can also tell me my ground speed at any given moment. 
Once again, as we bounce around, this will be an average over a second or two. It can't predict how the speed will change with any change in height or heading, so I have to do that ahead of time or be behind the game. My wind angle MDR, that's the mental dead reckoning, will give me an average for the whole leg, which is more useful. What I really need to know isn't my ground speed, but my time early or late on the leg. To do this, I need to know how far I have to go and a time available to get there. A GPS won't tell me that. I have to, um, what do they call it? Navigate. This is where our fixed point planning pays off. If I've calculated my ground speed for the whole leg, I can then estimate my ETA not only at the destination, but also at the intermediate fixed points. If, when I get to those points, the timing isn't right, then I can make corrections and reduce the error before I actually have to get to the waypoint and check it there. I can keep ahead of the game. Now we're settled on track, I can pay some attention to the timing. We've planned to fly this whole route at 60 knots ground speed, which equals about 2,850 RPM in still air. Well, that clearly isn't going to happen today. We're being bounced around like a toad on a trampoline, and this is probably due to the turbulence we noted earlier with the mountains disturbing the air ahead. My best plan for getting to smoother air is to go higher, but this means a slower ground speed for a while, so we'll get late. I do some sums in my head like we discussed. I take a guess at the wind strength of about 25 knots as we climb to 5,000 feet, where we should have smoother conditions. We're tracking, at least I hope we're tracking, 184, and the wind is probably going to, be, going to veer a bit as we go up. So from 240? If we say 240 minus 184 is as good as damn it, 60 degrees off the nose, 90 minus 60 is 30, 30 is half, so my ground speed will be 60 minus half for 25. Let's call that 13 knots, shall we? That makes 47 knots, or about 25% slower than we planned. So I can estimate that my ETA at the next point, Bravo, won't be alpha plus 18, but alpha plus 23, roughly speaking. Because it's taken me a minute or so to assess all this, I take a guess that we'll be at Bravo at 0933, according to the cockpit clock. The phone's gone blank, and I can't get it to wake up no matter how hard I stab at the buttons. But as I'm not too busy right now, I do the arithmetic for the ETA at Charlie as well, which is the bottom end of the route, and I make it 0952. A bit earlier than the MDR suggests, because once I get to height, I can accelerate to 70 knots and balance the increased wind, which might be 30 knots up there, might even be more. Well, it was. I got that a bit wrong. The actual time of arrival, the ETA at Bravo, was 0941. That's 12 minutes late. Well, how did that happen? Maybe my arithmetic's way out, but something's definitely not right. Never mind that now, let's get on with the housekeeping. Well clearly the estimate was a long way out, but that's not unusual when using average winds, a guess at a ground speed which will be slower in the climb, and probably a wobbly track. Never mind, we know where we are because I can see Tom and Towel in the 2 o'clock low, and the road's under my right wing. As we leave Bravo, I reset the backup stopwatch, note the time from the cockpit clock, and turn to point 179 so that the twin peaks left and right of track, about five miles ahead, are just to the left and right of my crosshairs. In fact, and what joy, I can see beyond them to the peaks of 2633 and 2720, and I need to pass between them. They're big, they're unique, and they have vertical extent ideal tracking features and I kick off enough drift to make sure that I'll eventually pass between them and then check the compass. Wobbling about but an average of 210 degrees. Well that's a surprise I've got 30 degrees or more of drift here. Not only am I crabbing over the landscape like a shopping trolley with a busted wheel I'm only making well you can do the sums as well now but at a guess the wind's now more like 240 at 35 maybe 40 knots. Time to reassess our ETA at Charlie maybe. Wind angle is 60, take from 90 gives 30, which is half the wind speed, so headwind is 20. Well, you knew that, didn't you? This leg was planned to take 21 minutes at 60, so how much at 40? I'll give you a few seconds to work that out. Right, that's enough. OK, so we're flying 33% slower, right? So it'll take us the same amount longer to reach Charlie. Yep, roughly, but remember that we'll be in the headwind for longer, so the cumulative effect will be greater. How much greater? Well, for the purposes of MDR, we can just say it's a bit. Well, how much is a bit? 
This is where practice comes in. And after a while, you just know. And that's what David Crockett would have called Kentucky windage. Practice and experience. Let's just say for now that our ETA at Charlie is now about 11 minutes past 10. Since it's taken us a minute to work that out and we've been slow in correcting our speed, I'll call that 1012. This was what I came up with at the time anyway. The air's a lot smoother now and we've got well above the rocks and trees that stir it all up. But as a result, it must be stronger and probably veered a bit. I'm looking forward over the nose to try to assess where I'm going as opposed to where I'm pointing. The comparison isn't ex as expected and I, as I'm at an altitude the peaks don't stand out so well as I'd like. Nothing for it but to stick to the plan and only change something when there's a definite reason. Like I see something I can positively identify as an error. In other words, don't touch a thing, stick to the plan. And so far of course we've been going in a straight line. Roughly anyway, as far as I can tell. Once we start turning life's going to get much more interesting. So. Having passed between the Twin Peaks and had the King's residence off the port wing, we cross the river and I reset the stopwatch because I know my turn at Charlie, insignificant as it is regarding ground features, is exactly five and a half miles beyond the river. I measured it earlier, see? I've sorted my ground speed now. I think it's 40 knots, so it'll take more than five and a half minutes to get to Charlie. 33% more, which is 33% at 330 seconds, which is 110 seconds or roughly two minutes. So we'll get there at seven minutes 30 on the stopwatch plus that bit of Kentucky windage. So roughly eight minutes. Everybody still with me? As we approach, I can see the lock until my four o'clock and the beginnings of the lock at nine o'clock. As a stopwatch winds up and the time to go winds down, a quick roll left and right confirms a Google Earth picture that I memorised and we can turn. Hurrah! The datum line is done. And finally we're on top of the timing, I think. But you can stop congratulating yourself, will you? Because you need to fly a sharp turn without losing speed, reset the stopwatch, note the actual time of arrival at Charlie on the log, reassess the wind and sort out the next heading and work out the next DTA and how early or late we are now and check the fuel contents and the engine temperatures and the weather ahead. <sighs> Pay attention at the back. Having been battling against the headwind for nearly an hour, we can look forward to a hefty shove northwards now. I can see the 1932 hill ahead and there's a very convenient heather fire right on it which makes the tracking easier and I make a mental note of it because we'll be passing this way again later. The smoke is almost flat to the ground which tells me the wind is definitely a lot stronger than I'd hoped for which might be bringing that frontal weather in a lot earlier. We're safely above the King's private airspace so I can relax a little and do some assessment. I've been listening to Scottish Centre on the radio and I gather that the weather to the south is deteriorating but not to the extent that I need to worry yet and the frontal system with its cloud and crud won't be a factor for me, at least in the short term. I reckon I've got a 30 knot tailwind up here so I can afford to cruise at 70 using a little more fuel but gaining a lot in time. It should have taken 9 minutes to delta but I estimate 7 and so it turns out. I can say that I've got the wind sorted at least for now at this height. This is a plog so far, and you can see the scribbles, and perhaps imagine the head scratching and finger counting that went with them. Now we've hardly been airborne an hour, and we've still got four to go. Waypoint Echo is easy to spot despite it being in a deep valley, and we have 30 degrees of drift. I've sorted the tracking by aiming between the hills of 2445 and 2294. When I say aiming, what I mean is that I notice the place I want to go to and I turn the aircraft so that place is, in this case, 30 degrees to the right of the drift site. As long as it stays in the same place on the canopy, a line of constant bearing, then I'll fly over it. The same goes for any aircraft we might see. If it stays in the same place in the window, you're going to hit it. This is useful knowledge. Eventually we get to Charlie for the second time. Easier this time as we have a perfect lead-in feature of the Y-shaped valley running out of Bremar. A check of the cockpit clock, we plan to be here at takeoff plus one hour at 26 and a half, which would be 10.36 and a half. So we're running about 25 minutes late. This is a lot to catch up. If this were a tactical route, I'd be planning to cut a few corners to make that up. But we can't do that because it will screw up the drawing. All I can do is fly faster and hope to make best use of any tailwinds. Flying faster uses more fuel, so I need to work out if, over the next three and a half hours, I've got enough. 
It's a good job I've got 10 fingers to count on. At least they don't need bloody software to work properly. The phone is now useless to me, by the way. The power saver keeps blacking the screen even though I turned it off. But since the safe sky position hasn't moved from takeoff and is showing nothing of any use, I've ignored it for the moment. I have a second stopwatch and a clock and a good pair of eyes to spot the traffic. So the lack of that must have safety aid isn't a showstopper. Heading west now, and I know we'll be back down to 30 or 40 knots over the ground, but once around the corner at India, we'll be rocketing northwards and picking up time. The cloud's definitely getting thicker now, but I'm still legal, and this is as far west as I need to go. We get to the top end at Juliet at 11.46, only 16 minutes now behind schedule, and with fuel in hand to keep the speed up to around 70, 75 to 80 for a while. The engine oil is getting hot now, so that's something else to keep an eye on. I'm getting a bit warm too. The air outside is 3 degrees Celsius, but in my mobile greenhouse it's 19. I take a few sips of my water, but my bladder advises caution, particularly now it's getting bloody bumpy again. A look around at the sky shows that the wind is probably increasing. There are more lenticular clouds around and using these I can predict where the air is rising and where the air is falling. If I can use the rising air to gain height I'll save fuel and if I dive off extra height in a downdraft I'll save fuel and gain distance and time. It now becomes a balance between staying low and enduring the, enduring the turbulence or getting higher in smoother air but stronger winds. I only want stronger winds when they're behind me, so the more southerly legs, southerly legs have to be lower and protected from the mountain top gales. Well, it is supposed to be a challenge, right? In God to stay cool, I'll take another sip of water and damn the risks. Through Quebec and on to Ballater for the turn north to draw the right wing of the badge. But something isn't right with the timing. I picked up some time at the north end and tried to hold a higher speed coming south. I should have been at Quebec on the plan at 12.07 and 30. I actually get there at 12.31, so I haven't made up any time at all really. While I'm wondering why that is and doing my sums again, I hit yet another turbulent bump in the air, and as the nose pitches up I see the cockpit clock stop. The second hand remains poised for two, three, four seconds, then starts ticking away again. A few seconds later, we hit another bump and the same thing happens. I experiment. The clock works fine when the second hand is going down from the 12 to the 6 o'clock, but between 7 and 11 o'clock it hangs around like a sad friend, losing about 10 seconds every minute. Well, you couldn't make it up, could you? A smartphone clock that doesn't work, a cockpit clock that's running slow, it's been fine for two years, well, thank you, God. I'm glad that I had a plan C for timing. Luckily, I've noticed this in time to make sensible corrections to our speed. Since the clock's been running slow, we're actually a bit ahead of ourselves in real time, and things are improving in terms of the timing target. In terms of fuel endurance, though, I reckon I've used up about half of my two-hour reserve with 90 minutes still to fly, and at a higher airspeed as well. I can only achieve a higher ground speed by staying high on the northerly leg to grab the benefit of stronger winds and low on the southerly, so this is an extra factor to incorporate. Another sip of water. We rocket away towards Sierra and steer using wind farms. I hate them, but today they're a blessing. And I get to the top at 12.58, 10 minutes late now, so we might just crack this. This is becoming a race against time, but I remind myself the timing target is secondary. The drawing is a reason for this, so I must stay on the line, and now I'm down in the terminus again, and it's bad. And I'm tired. 
The MDR is taking more effort than before and I've got the beginnings of cramp in my right calf muscle. The fingers on my left hand are really cold on the throttle and one of the cameras has lost its power lead, which means a minute of fumbling around trying to swap cables over from a useless phone to vital recorder. While the nose of the aeroplane goes all over the place because I don't have an autopilot nor any aileron trim. <sighs> Turn at Tango and the massive wind farm on the cab rack gives me a superb tracking feature. Hack the watch at Hill 2241 and turn after 90 seconds plus a bit at, bit at Victor. About 2 minutes late on leg time, 15 late on route time. We feel the need for speed. I push the noise lever another 2 centimeters forward and ignore the calculations. Let's just hurry up and sort out the details later. X-ray is hard to work out since the trees have been cut down, but I can ignore the problem as I see the 2294 and 2310 hills ahead and set up my track to pass between them. Yankee. I turn when the lock's at 3 o'clock since there's no drift on this leg and check the clock. 13.38. It's 31 miles to the end point which we aim to overfly at 1400. So we needed to be here at 1400 minus 31. 13.29. We're 9 minutes late. I wondered if we can make it. Let's just do some sums. Here's my MDR workings for that little question. Let's call it 30 miles to go. Time available is 22 minutes, which for the sake of argument I'll call 20. It's an easier sum and is pessimistic so I can only get better on the timeline. 30 miles in 20 minutes is one and a half miles a minute or 90 knots. The wind is 220 at 40 knots, so my ground speed will be, will be my true airspeed plus 40 on the northerly track. If I fly an indicated airspeed of about 60, I should be fine, but I'll fly at 70 so I have some time in hand. Travelling north now on the last two legs and I'm checking the timing against every feature I can recognise. This is where every cross track feature is useful. Every road, river, power line, the edges of built up areas all give me a definite you should be here check on timing. We're now at Zulu, on top with two minutes to go. Three miles to the end of the route. Perfect. Turn, stopwatch versus wristwatch. Seconds gone against seconds to go. Juggling the throttle to nail the speed, weaving the nose to keep the last waypoint in clear sight. Clock is ticking, twisting and turning the aeroplane to nail that end point on top now. Check the watch, 1403 seconds, and I have a happy face. Whew. Well, all that and it just remains to get back on the ground, which might be a challenge in itself as the wind has really picked up now and is going to be tricky to manage. I'll land slightly across the strip, as much into wind as possible, with no flat. A few harsh words to myself as we turn finals, along the lines of you better pay close attention to this matey, and a lovely touchdown and almost no ground roll. has worked. I really don't fancy doing that again. I sat in the cockpit for a full five minutes after shutdown just enjoying the silence. Nobody about wanted to know how it went, just the ticking of cooling metal. Bliss. A quick photo of the clock, struggle out the tin bath, unplug all the cameras, switch off all the toys and dash behind the shed to relieve some bladder pressure. Time now to check the safe sky track log for the evidence. Nothing. It's blank. No record. Oh. Check the flight aware. Well, it's got something, but not everything. It hasn't recorded the first hour for some reason. All hopes pinned on the Sky Demon now, which has been ticking along behind my left elbow for five hours and more. I hope it has anyway. Well, thankfully it did, and faultlessly. I've got a full record of all the timings, which later I can use to confirm my own notes. It also proved that I hit my timing target and stayed reasonably close to the planned track. There were a few hiccups, but these are only really visible if I zoom right in on the, uh, on the map which I download later on, which is a good thing. Hopefully the judges won't be getting a magnifier out. Thank you, Sky Demon. If it weren't for you, I'd be doing it all over again. Dip the fuel tank. Six litres left. 
I started with 32 and a bit, so 26 litres took 5 hours to burn. So 5 litres an hour for estimation purposes is about right. So let's debrief. The priority was to get a visual record of the Ukrainian emblem. And this is what the three tracking devices came up with. Safe Sky. Flight Aware. Partial success, but not acceptable for this task. Sky Demon. Well, I couldn't ask for more, really, could I? On top of the drawing, it also recorded all the timing details and the altitudes en route. That'll let the judges reconstruct the flight in as much detail as they need, so perhaps they won't have to listen to a word I've said over the last few minutes. I hope that hasn't applied to everyone, though. It's been a fun challenge to take part in, the video record has been an interesting project, and I hope it might have been an inspiration to make the most of the mini sport. Thanks for watching. Slava Ukraini.